All right, my people. I am just learning how to use Zoom by myself and realized I just recorded about 10 minutes of lecture without hitting the record button. <laughs> so let's start over. I'm Libby Cox and I, this recording is for Everyone Yoga School for the 200 hour teacher training program that runs from 2018 to 2019. This is a lecture entitled An Overview of the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. Last time we met, we talked about a specific part of the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali um, called Ashtanga Yoga, or the Eight Limbs of Yoga, which you can find in the second book of the four books of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. So the second book is called Sadhana Pada. I like to begin with the eight limbs because I think it's a nice way of understanding the microcosm within the macrocosm of the Yoga Sutra. And also, um, in the West, I, I might wager to say, we do spend a fair amount of time thinking about yoga as a practice. And so in the second chapter, that is when, you, that is when Patanjali discusses um, yoga as a practice, eight limbs of practice. And just to review, those eight limbs are yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So we have eight limbs, and I appreciate that I can only count to five on one hand, and we have three left over here. This is a nice metaphor. Patanjali considers the first five limbs of the eight limb practice to be what I understand as external observances or practices. Yama and niyama, ways that we treat ourselves, ways that we treat each other in society. Number three, asana. Take care of your body, move your body, pay attention to what your body needs in order to function better, in order to function well. Pranayama, number four, breathe. Um, asana is meant, uh, in my understanding, according to Patanjali, to help us stretch and strengthen the accessory muscles of breathing, to understand how the body breathes and the purpose of the breath in terms of the brain, in that the breath is hardwired to the brain. So if we change our breath, we change the brain. Speaking of the central nervous system, right? The brain and the spinal cord, yes? <clears throat> so if we slow down the breath, the brain is changing, the brain waves are changing. And we're also in yoga attempting to practice the fifth limb, which is pratyahara. Pratyahara means to draw the senses or the faculties of the senses inward in order to deep, more deeply experience our inner life, our, our consciousness, our embodied consciousness. Um, so to take the faculties of the senses and to turn that awareness inward, as the Bhagavad Gita says, like a tortoise going into its shell. These are the first five limbs. They are considered hatha yoga. Hatha yoga meaning, in this case, external practices, things that we can actually physiologically do and create in order to have a yoga experience, an experience of, as Patanjali says in the beginning of his text, an experience of yoga as the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. So this is a translation of the second Yoga Sutra, so chapter one, verse two, Atta Yoga Nushasanam, now we practice yoga, Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of individual consciousness or of the mind. So as we continue in the eight limbs, these last three are considered to be more of the meditative aspect of Patanjali's yoga. Uh, some would call this raja yoga, R-A-J-A. Raja means king or royal or queen. So to be exalted, to be sovereign of the mind's capacity to recognize um, the expansiveness of consciousness, but also the ability to focus consciousness on a single point. Dharana, concentrate. Dhyana, meditate. Samadhi, absorption with respect to sameness, as Douglas Brooks translates it. Um, so these three are considered to be um, aspects of having a meditative or be, having a meditative state, or being in um, an altered uh, level of awareness in terms of our consciousness. 
<laughs> that is a lot of information. So I wanted to just review those eight limbs because I think we'll see um, the un <clears throat> excuse me underlying philosophies that are present in not just the eight limbs but also in the larger Yoga Sutra as a text. So as a means for diving in, we review this one aspect of Ashtanga Yoga within Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Um, in order to understand what Patanjali is trying to convey in the Yoga Sutra, it can be useful to start at the beginning <laughs> and uh, look at the first three or four or so verses of the first chapter, which is called Samadhi Pada. So in a moment, we'll begin there. Uh, my goal over the next hour is to give you the, an overview of a philosophical point of view according to Patanjali. And then in the next hour and 15 minute video that I will do tomorrow or the next day, I will do uh, Yoga Sutra's Greatest Hits and we'll look at specific passages throughout the text and break them down, dive into them a little more deeply. So if you look at your notes, you can see that um, uh, toward the beginning of your notes, I believe I, I wrote something to the effect of the Yoga Sutra is a how-to manual on a practice of yoga according to Patanjali. In my mind, it reads a lot like an auto repair manual and a very specific auto repair manual. And the, the auto part may be um, in terms of automatic, in terms of the mind, the underworkings of the mind. So this is a, a very precise, um, spelled out description of evolution of consciousness toward a yogic state. So it's both the practice of yoga, description of the practices of yoga, and also of the state of being in yoga, or union, or, or integration or depth of relationship, depth of engagement between and among body, mind, and consciousness, body, mind, and heart, body, mind, and spirit. So there are four chapters, four books, four padas, four feet, in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. The first is Samadhi Pada, Samadhi Pada. And Samadhi Pada, again, that's the last of the eight limbs and also the name of the first text. Samadhi means absorption or with respect to sameness. And Patanjali describes in that text Samadhi as varying states of consciousness that are leading us more toward singularity, toward this um, cosmic consciousness, which he calls Purusha at different times. Purusha, P U R. U-S-A or P-U-R-U-S-H-A. So <clears throat> he starts there. Uh, let me list the other three books and then we'll go back to Samadhi Pada as a means of understanding the underlying philosophy in the Yoga Sutra. So the next chapter is Sadhana Pada. Sadhana means practice. And here he outlines the eight limbs of yoga and then goes into more detail about how those limbs um, play into each other, play into the next one, and help a, an aspirant on the path of yoga have tools to assist us along the way on our, on our way to an enlightened experience toward this single-pointed focus, toward this feeling of total absorption um, into Purusha cosmic consciousness. Chapter three is called Vibhuti Pada, Vibhuti Pada. Vibhuti, um, my understanding of that word means um, applied to earth, B-H-U, Pu, um, and V in a particular way. So Vibhuti Pada lists yoga superpowers, <laughs> what happens when we apply the first five limbs of the eight-limbed practice, and then we start to be able to meditate, do dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, concentration, meditation, and total absorption, um, onto certain specific concepts, objects, ideas. So when I first read this, um, I thought it was a metaphor, 
And after years of practice, I'm not so sure it's a metaphor. I think that he is uh, being literal. So we'll look at that. Um, consider that the chapter of what happens when you turn your single point of focus toward one specific thing like the moon or like a candle flame or like God or like another person or a plant. Um, so there are different meditation techniques, as it were, and descriptions of the results of using that particular kind of meditation, what kinds of um, consciousness you will experience. The fourth chapter is called Kaivalya Pada. Kaivalya Pada. Kaivalya means, according to BKS Iyengar, if I remember correctly in his translation of the Yoga Sutra, light on the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. Kaivalya means independence. Sometimes I've heard it translated as aloneness. So this is also a description of moving toward a state of being in yoga, in, in enlightenment, as if you will. Um, it, so it's descriptions of moving through various stages of a human life and what um, and how yoga unfolds in these various stages at times it also describes various ways that people might come to have these experiences of enlightenment or these experiences of samadhi um, with different uh, different tools and techniques so kaivalya pada um, goes into more detail and also repeats some previous themes um, within the yoga sutra about the the nature of what will happen to a human being as we embark on this journey of the uh, within the Yoga Sutra. So, Samadhi Pada, Sadhana Pada, Vibhuti Pada, and Kaivalya Pada. Four Padas within the Yoga Sutra. So, let's take a look at the first few verses in the first Pada, Samadhi Pada. So, the very first verse. Patanjali says, Atta Yoga Nushasanam. Now we begin the practice of yoga. This is one translation of that sutra. So right now, now and now and now and now and now, we begin the practice of yoga. Every time you read that particular verse, it says now. Every moment is a chance to practice or be renew, re begin again the practice of yoga. I want to pause here for a moment and say in the context of this recording that I was taught and I also um, I believe in this teaching that with a text that is in another language, whether it's French or Spanish or Sanskrit, um, if you can, try and read more than one translation, maybe even two very different translations at once. Um, different translators translate Sanskrit in different ways. So I would recommend having more than one text open at once where you're comparing and contrasting, maybe even if you get fancy word by word, um, the different ways that we are translating these Yoga Sutra. So, um, and to know, and I, uh, I think I learned this from Douglas Brooks, that um, any translator, whether consciously or not, is going to push their, uh, their agenda through the text. So, with respect to most translations um, coming into our language from another language, um, there are instances where the translator might be taking liberties because of their own personal point of view, their own beliefs. So it's important to, to bear that in mind. Um, and then to maybe someday down the road, learn Sanskrit yourself. Uh, I probably won't do that in my lifetime. I've learned from other teachers. I have yet to take a course in Sanskrit. I would really recommend it. It's been recommended to me by other people to even just spend some time with the Sanskrit alphabet and to understand how, um, how it's really shaping and what the idea is uh, in yoga at large. 
uh, in the many, many, many texts that describe yoga practices. Um, yoga Sutra is just one text describing one kind of yoga practice. Okay, so Atta Yoga Nushasanam. If you break down, if we break down the various sounds within that one sutra, you can see how a study of the Yoga Sutra could take a whole lot longer than two hours and 15 minutes. Um, so Atta, A-T-H-A, -A, Atta. Atta means now. And then we have the word yoga. So we talked about that a little bit last week, which is to define, or two weeks ago maybe, to define that word yoga. Um, one of the more prominent ways we get a definition of yoga is Y-U-J, the verbal root, Y-U-J, yuj, which means to yoke, uh, to draw together, to unite, to create a relationship, to create a relationship of deeper intimacy, to engage. So now we engage. Uh, yoga, yoga anushasanam, anushasanam, anu, I learned from Douglas Brooks, um, is the pre prefix in English C-O-N, con, like converse. When we converse, we are turning verse together, con, converse, turning together. Um, so together. Now we engage, we yoga together. Shasana, a shastra. Shastra means a scientific method or experiment toward finding truth. So now we engage together in an experiment in finding truth. Best of my understanding. Um, again, you'll get different translations, so I warmly recommend that you look at a few. So this first Yoga Sutra. Second Sutra is when Patanjali gives us his definition of yoga. He says, yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodaha. Yoga is the consciousness wave stopping. Chitta vritti nirodaha, consciousness wave stopping. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind. Yoga is the stopping of the churning of individual consciousness. Um, this is his definition of yoga. He says, when the mind is able to be still, then the seer can abide in her or his own essential nature. Tada drastur svarupe avastanam. This is the third verse. I may have um, accidentally told you that uh, the fourth verse was the third earlier. So let me clear this up. So he says, why would we want to cease the fluctuations of individual consciousness? Well, he says, then we can really see what's happening in between our thoughts and underneath this the, the churning and the fluctuations and the machinations of our mind stuff. Now, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I certainly can. My mind is just racing sometimes from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to sleep, and um, which is why yoga. <laughs> if I can get a moment where I feel still and calm and quiet and connected to my breath, I feel sometimes literally like a different person or that I could even be a different way when I step back out into the world. I'm not, um, I'm not stuck in the, in the churning of individual consciousness. Uh, so in, in verse four, he says that essentially the rest of the time we're over identifying with the fluctuations of the mind. And then throughout Samadhi Pada, he's, he describes um, five different ways that mind fluctuates. And then as we move through the layers that uh, he considers to be obstacles to a calm and centered and present mind, mental space, consciousness, he describes almost a, an, an escalator, a ladder, upward toward this place he calls near bija samadhi near bija near like nirvana and i r mean uh, nirvana i learned means extinction and bija is the word meaning seed in sanskrit so no more seed um anybody a gardener um, or have a little, a little bit of land or pay attention to how a tree makes more and more seeds. Every plant has a way of 
continuing more plants that are just like it. So, uh, so the same is with thoughts. Each thought can be like a seed planted in the, in the fertile, yucky, sometimes soil of our consciousness um, that can beget more and more thoughts. And, we're, and in this kind of philosophy, there's this idea that we are stuck or in the mire, in the, in the samskara, in the, in the flow of consciousness, and that yoga is the process of standing still when everything else is just moving all around us. And if we can have no more seed, we can climb the ladder of consciousness, as um, Dr. Brooks would say, and kick it away. So let's pause there, because this is an essential way of understanding, I think, an underlying philosophical idea or premise that Patanjali is talking about. It gives us a certain specific kind of yoga. So I, I learned that this kind of yoga we could call a vertical model. That enlightenment, um, in a silly way, enlightenment is not the experience you're currently having. <laughs> that it is a purifying, it's a purified, rarefied, distilled, um, singular experience. That as long as we are associating with this mortal coil, uh, we are not experiencing. So it is a vertical model. We are meant, according to Patanjali, to cleanse and clarify all of the aspects of our physiology, our prakriti, P-R-A-K-R-I-T-I, prakriti, means toward action, also sometimes called our manifest nature, right? The body. It, Patanjali considers the mind a physical, palpable thing that we live inside of that we cannot know because we're, we're living inside of it. Like, does a fish know that it's swimming in water? Um, do we really are, it's, we are so close to the mind and the body and the breath and everything in between <laughs> that has to do with our corporeal existence that we cannot experience Purusha unless we cleanse all of these lenses of our perception, our ability to take in sensory information, to, um, to, to um, what else do I want to say? Uh, if the body is ill, it can be much harder to clear the mind. We take care of the body, we deepen the breath, we gain access to the central nervous system. Again, here we are in the eight limbs. The goal of his yoga, of this yoga, is vertical. We are to rise up, and I keep doing this because it's an experience um, some would describe as a kundalini process. Kundalini is a coiled, feminine, encoded serpentine energy, a powerhouse that sits at the base of the spine. And from a yogic anatomy point of view, the point of yoga is to awaken kundalini and to give her passage straight through the central channel, sushum nanadi, the spine, the central nervous system, and then she pierces outward through the crown in order to release us from this limited and conditioned and mortal body and to help us unite with this cosmic consciousness. So it's a prakriti to purusha model. It's a bondage to freedom model. It's a vertical model. Let me push on this a little harder and say the body is in your way. Your mind is in your way. We need to release our attachment to our individual consciousness, to our, pers our, our attachments, to our personality, to our ego even, um, uh, or maybe to our egotism. So we'll talk about that a little bit more because that's in one of the, the sutras as well. Um, in order to experience Purusha. So I'd like to take a moment and pause and really look at this particular form of philosophy, this vertical model. Um, a fancy term for it might be a dualistic model or even a dualist theist 
model because Patanjali does talk about God, about the divine. Uh, his word um, in a certain part of the text is Ishvara, like in the fifth Niyama, Ishvara Pranidhana, to surrender. This is one of the things he suggests that we do in order to move forward in our yoga practice, to practice surrendering or offering ourselves to God. Um, and just to review, you can be an atheist, you can be a Christian, Muslim, Hindu, um, Quaker. It doesn't matter your belief um, in order to practice these techniques of yoga. Um, but Patanjali does talk about God. So it's really rather a question than an answer. Um, but some would consider this particular form of philosophy to be a dualist, theist model, that we are seeking out something that is higher or greater or bigger than our individual self. Okay, so for you visual learners, I would like to offer you a drawing that I usually make to describe this form of yoga philosophy. And I forgot to turn off my cell phone. Excuse me. Okay, so this is how I was taught, I think from uh, Chase Bossert, who is a really amazing Yoga Sutra scholar, B O S S A R T, Chase Bossar. And it goes like this You are a lake. And the surface of the lake, there are waves. These. Patanjali calls the vrittis, right? These are the fluctuations of our consciousness. So you're a lake. And here we are living inside the lake. And beneath the surface of the lake are undercurrents. And Patanjali's word and other um, yoga philosophers word for these undercurrents are some samskaras. So samskara means um, our, our karmas, previous karmas, or um, I've, I've come to start thinking of it as DNA. Like what we come in with, the underlying encoded patterns um, of, our, of our cognitive understanding of ourselves in the world. And they are influencing what's happening on a daily basis as we have these thoughts and feelings and fluctuations on the, on our, on the surface of our daily interactions with ourselves and with others, our vrittis, our, our chitta vrittis, our, the fluctuations of our individual consciousness. Now, Patanjali says that if we could calm the waters, if we could still the fluctuations of the ocean of consciousness, we, the surface of the lake would become calm, right? It would be more like a straight line. And that when the surface of the lake is calm, suddenly we would be able to recognize that the whole time next to this lake there's a mountain and we've been so mired and caught up in the samskaras and our underlying encoded beliefs and in the surface fluctuations of the mind that we didn't even know that there was a mountain next to our lake. And so the lake could be called Prakriti and the mountain Purusha. Okay, the lake Prakriti and the mountain Purusha. I added an H there just for English pronunciation. Sometimes it's spelled without Purusha and Prakriti. 
So the goal of Patanjali's yoga is to cease the fluctuations of the mind, calming the lake, all the flotsam and jetsam settles to the bottom. We're no longer influenced by our, um, here, let me put it in another maybe radical way. Our, we're no longer influenced by the inheritance of our ancestry, right? What the mistakes that our fathers and mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and so on and so forth, the mistakes that they made that we inherited through our DNA, we're no longer subject to that. In a sense, we can overcome it as the vrittis calm, the vrittis cease to fluctuate, and we have knowledge that there is purusha. And then you might, Matt, you might um, continue on this journey as such, upward toward the top of the mountain. And the top of the mountain has different names um, in in my particular study of Tantra, we might say that Shiva is on the mountain, right? That which under, ironically, his name means that which underlies, right? He's the dancing lord of yoga. He's the pinnacle representation of the unmanifest, completely connected cosmic consciousness. So, what happens on the surface of a body of water on a calm, clear day? That body of water becomes a mirror. And this is one of the ways that I like to solve for, um, what I've come to understand as some problematics in within Patanjali's yoga philosophy, where at times he will say that as long as we're still experiencing something of our humanity, we will never be able to live as Purusha. That we actually have to transcend, extricate, exempt, fancy Douglas Brooks words for um, enlightened experience. And, um, other times he will say we are nothing but Purusha, that as we kind of, to borrow from another model, peel back or peel away the layers of our human experience, like the koshas, our physical layer, our energy layer, our emotional layer, our cognitive layer, and we're able to live completely in our, the innermost kernel of our bliss, we are Purusha. We are this cosmic consciousness. And he says both. Sometimes we're not, and sometimes we are. So this is how I solve for that, that um, if we really are calming, we're living in this ocean of consciousness, we're calming the fluctuations of the mind, the mountain is going to be reflected into the lake. This is also justification for practices that talk about the importance of going downward into our own muck. And that enlightenment is also way down here. So we have to travel to the depths of our most raw and primal elements in order to experience our most exalted um, consciousness, exalted consciousness. Okay, so this is an image that's, that's really helped me over the years. Um, if you want to go back to your yoga philosophy, you, could I, can I do this upside down and backwards? If this is Shiva, oh, no, I can't. Then this would be Shakti, right? Feminine. Um, find your inner Dan Brown. And can you see the um, sword and the chalice, right? So a downward triangle is sometimes considered to be a, a um, simple image, icon, symbol of the feminine, the uterus, um, and then the masculine encoded aspect of the upward pointing triangle as perhaps a phallus or a penis. So there, there are also ways of kind of reading into this kind of interpretation of the philosophy that one is more masculine encoded and that one is more
feminine encoded, meaning that um, we, we are able to find wisdom in, in understanding our ability to manifest and wisdom in our ability to rise to the most exalted, singular, um, expanded, cosmic consciousness. How it is simultaneously true, um, some would say that we are experiencing this material reality and that there's more going on than we can, than we can possibly fathom. Um, Patanjali yoga, in my understanding, is is more interested in this up and out model. Um, and so we call it a vertical model. I'm going to stop there. And we can talk more about this next time. But I wanted to introduce you to this idea because we will see it over and over again in the practices and the ways that Patanjali Yoga is, is seeking this verticality, this idea of enlightenment as a singular endeavor, um, as a purifying path where we are um, cleansing and removing the obstacles of anything that could arise in the body or in the breath, in our energy, uh, or in our consciousness. So the next time we come together, we'll go through, um, with this philosophy in mind, we'll go through and um, look at certain specific yoga sutras, different pa uh, passages, different threads in the larger book. We'll look at, for example, um, the kleshas, which is Patanjali's list of five main obstacles to enlightenment. We'll look at um, our relationship with uh, pain and suffering, our relationship with various forms of meditation, um, what he sees as really the baseline understanding of having a yoga practice that is to hold two things together, two opposing things together simultaneously, hatha yoga. Yoga is to hold or to yoke or to engage in hatha, sun and moon, masculine and feminine, two opposite and equal things simultaneously, right? To be continued. <laughs>